Hi everyone and welcome to our antibiotics video series. Antibiotics are heavily tested across all USMLE step exams, not only because they're perfect material for creating difficult questions, but because we use them in our everyday practice. Well, sometimes a little too much, but this is past the point. In this video, we will be discussing the classification of antibiotics and their mechanism of action, which is high yield for step one, step two and step three, trust me. And in the upcoming videos, we will be dealing with each antibiotics group separately, like there's going to be one video on cephalosporins, one video on penicillins, etc. So stay tuned for those as well. I made slides for this video as I believe slides will make it more clear and organized, especially for those of you who have visual memory. So let's start with the classification of antibiotics. Let's clear the confusion about the difference between antimicrobials and antibiotics. An antimicrobial is an agent that kills microorganisms or stops their growth. Antimicrobial medications can be grouped according to the microorganisms they act primarily against, as you can see here on this slide. We have antibiotics, antifungals, antiparasitic and antiviral medications. The antibiotics work on gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. The antifungals work against fungi like candida, histoplasmosis, blastomycosis, etc. The antiparasitic drugs work against parasites like tinea, the diphyllobotrium latum, echinococcus and others. And the antivirals work on viruses like hepatitis, HIV, CMV, coxsackie, polio, etc. Once we have cleared this out, let's begin with the classification of antibiotics. Now, if I say high yield, I will be underplaying it. It is very important for you to know this classification for all steps. On step 3 especially, that's how they will get you to fail. They will throw at you some questions from step 1 that they're expecting from you to have long forgotten. But that's why we are here to warn you and to prepare you for their tricky games. So, commit this classification to memory. Come up with an easy mnemonic if you wish or repeat it every third day in order to store it in your long-term memory. But make it happen. And if you know a cool mnemonic, please do share it. Okay, so let's read this out loud. Now we have bactericidal and bacteriostatic antibiotics. The bactericidal antibiotics are those who kill the bacteria. And here we have the aminoglycosides with antibiotics like amicacin, gentamicin, neomycin, tobramycin, paromomycin, plasomycin and streptomycin. This by the way is one of the high yield notes I'm posting on our official Instagram account daily. For more high yield USMLE notes you can follow me there and you can see the account name on this slide. The next group uh, from our bactericidal list is the cephalosporin generations. We have five generations and you need to know every single drug that is here on this slide. So in the first generation we have cefazolin and cefalexin. In the second generation we have cefotetan, cefuxetin, cefuruxime and cefachlor. In the third generation we have cefotaxim, ceftazidim, ceftrioxone, cefixim and cefdinir. In the fourth generation we have cefepime and in the fifth generation we have ceftarulin and ceftubipro. Next on our bactericidal list are the fluoroquinolones and the antibiotics there are ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, moxifloxacin, ofloxacin and delafloxacin. And next we have metronidazole and then we have the penicillin drugs. The penicillins we have the penicillin G like penicillin benzatine G, which is IM formulation, and penicillin V, which has oral administration. The antistaphylococcal penicillins inhibit the penicillinase, which is also known as transpeptidase enzyme. And we'll discuss what are these enzymes in a bit. And these are not used for methicillin resistant strains of Staph aureus or commonly known as MRSA. Second, third and fourth generations are broad spectrum penicillins. The second generation is used main, mainly for E. coli, Salmonella, Shigella, H. influenzae infections. And third and fourth generations 
are also known as anti pseudomonal as they are very active against pseudomonas infections. And the last from our bactericidal list is vancomycin. Alright, so moving on to the bacteriostatic antibiotics. They limit the growth of bacteria by interfering with bacterial protein production, DNA replication or other aspects of bacterial cellular metabolism. Basically, they prevent the bacteria from multiplying and we will cover the mechanism of action of each antibiotic in a bit. So here in this group we have clindamycin, horanfenicol, the macrolides like azithromycin, claritromycin, erythromycin and telithromycin. We have the linezolide and we also have tetracyclines with the doxycycline, minocycline, tetracycline and tigacycline. And now this question marks that you are seeing next to the trimetoprim and sulfonamides is because the confusion exists regarding their mechanism of action. As far as I know, both trimetoprim and the sulfonamides, which group include sulfamethoxazole, sulfadiazine, etc., are weakly bactericidal and the combo of TMP and SMX is very bactericidal. Now, a couple of years back when I was preparing for step 1, TMP and SMX was always classified as bacteriostatic. For that reason, double check with the latest versions of the resources that you're using to prepare for the steps and see what they have to say about this matter. I believe they're bactericidal, it doesn't hurt to double check and if you do, please let me know in the comment section below. Maybe you already know this, but in case you don't, let me show you something cool here. Some of our antibiotics can actually have a dual mechanism of action. They can be both bactericidal or bacteriostatic. For example, our fluoroquinolones, who are primarily bactericidal, can have bacteriostatic mechanism of action in high doses. Probably this is due uh, to RNA synthesis dose-dependent inhibition. Azithromycin here is primarily bacteriostatic, right? But it can be bactericidal against strep pyogenes and strep pneumonia. And also linezolide here is primarily bacteriostatic but can be bactericidal against strep species. Alright, moving on to the mechanism of action of antibiotics. It is very simple. Our antibiotics target three things. The cell wall, which supports the structure of the bacteria and protects it from lysis. The ribosomes, where the proteins are synthesized. And the DNA. And that's it. Not difficult, right? Okay, let's see which antibiotic targets which structure of the bacterial cell. It is getting very interesting here. Here you can see a list of the antibiotics that target the bacterial cell wall. All of these antibiotics, as you can imagine, are bactericidal, as once the cell wall is destroyed, the bacteria dies. There is no other option, there is no plan B for the bacteria. In order to understand how our antibiotics work, we need to understand the structure of the bacterial cell wall. This is how science works. The cell wall of both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria is composed of peptidoglycan. And this peptidoglycan is made of polysaccharide chains cross-linked by peptides containing D-amino acids. And what makes the gram-negative bacteria gram-negative is the fact that they have only one single layer of peptidoglycan, which is surrounded by a membranous structure called the outer membrane, which is made of lipopolysaccharides. On the other hand, the gram-positive bacteria don't have outer membrane, but instead they have thick peptidoglycan layer, which retains the color of the crystal violet stain in the gram stain. So on gram stain, gram-positive bacteria will look violet-ish, and the gram-negative bacteria will look pinkish, as the violet dye will be washed off, as they cannot retain it again due to the single layer of peptidoglycan in their cell wall. Going back to the peptidoglycan now, what we need to understand in order to understand the mechanism of action of the antibiotics is how the peptidoglycan layer is made. And it is really cool. The biosynthesis of the peptidoglycan is mediated by enzymes called transpeptidase, which facilitate the final transpeptidation or also called cross-linking of the peptidoglycan layer. This cross-linking is a very important step as that is what gives the cell wall its rigidity. 
Now these transpeptidases are also called penicillin binding proteins or PBPs. Do you know why? Well, because the penicillins bind exactly there. And I'm sure you know, but let's refresh. All enzymes are proteins, but not all proteins are enzymes. I'm not sure if this quote belongs to someone, but I remember it from my step one preparation studies. Alright, so on our slide here, we have beta-lactam antibiotics, like the carbapenem groups, which include meropenem, imipenem and ertapenem. We have the cephalosporins and we have the monobactams, which include astronam and we have penicillins. All of these are beta-lactam antibiotics. Apart from that, we have vancomycin and bacitracin, which also block the cell wall synthesis. Now, the beta-lactam antibiotics are called beta-lactams because they all have beta-lactam ring in their structure, which ring binds to the, guess what? To the PBPs, of course, and inhibit the peptidoglycan cross-linking, and thus they stop the cell wall synthesis. So, no cell wall, bacteria undergo lysis and die. Simple as that. On the other hand, vancomycin and bacitracin inhibit the peptidoglycan synthesis and lead again to the same final result. As you can imagine though, the bacteria are evolving and after years of exposing them to our beta-lactam antibiotics, they have developed a way to synthesize beta-lactamase enzyme, which destroys the beta-lactam ring of the antibiotics and make them useless. As a result though, we, we came up with beta-lactamase inhibitors which block the bacterial beta-lactamase enzymes and allow our beta-lactam antibiotics to do their job in peace. Such beta-lactamase inhibitors are clavulanic acid, sulbactam and tazobactam. Moving on to the antibiotics that block the bacterial protein synthesis. These antibiotics are bacteriostatic as they do not kill directly the bacteria, but they prevent the growth of the bacteria. They keep them in stationary, also static phase of growth. Basically, no growth. First, a few words about protein synthesis. As you know, proteins are made of long chains of amino acids joined together, and the instructions for making proteins are found in the bacterial DNA, which is found in the bacterial chromosome. The DNA instructions are transcribed into RNA, DNA and RNA are also called nucleic acids and they are made of nucleotides, which are made of sugar and nitrogenous base. The bases in the DNA are adenine and guanine, which are purine bases, and cytosine and thymine, which are pyrimidine bases. The only difference in the RNA bases is that it contains uracil instead of thymine. Alright, so once the DNA instructions are transcribed into messenger RNA or mRNA, this piece of RNA moves to the cell organelles called ribosomes to produce protein, a process called translation. As you can remember, we have three types of RNA. The messenger RNA carries the coding instructions of an amino acid sequence of the protein to be made. The transport RNA, the tRNA, carries specific amino acids to the ribosome to form the polypeptide chain. And the rRNA, the ribosomal RNA, forms the ribosomes along with other ribosomal proteins. The bacterial ribosomes, as you can see on the slide here, consist of two major components. The small ribosomal subunit, which reads the RNA, and the large subunit, which joins amino acids to form polypeptide chain. Now you see there are some numbers in our ribosomal units here. The large subunit is also referred to as 50S and is made of 23S and 5S, which numbers stand for the sedimentation coefficients of the rRNA in Svedberg units. And the small unit is referred to as 30S, made of 16S. Now, why is this important to us? Well, because it is heavily tested on step one. They like them tiny little details. And also to understand why the antibiotics that target bacterial protein synthesis do not destroy our human cells. The answer is that the ribosomes of eukaryotes are bigger than the ones in the prokaryotes. We humans have 60S RNA, made of 28 and 23S as a large ribosomal subunit. And we have 40S, 
made of 18S rRNA as a small ribosomal unit. And the antibiotics are so made that they attack only the smaller prokaryotic ribosomal subunits. Now, how cool is that? Going back to our antibiotics. So here we have the antibiotics that inhibit the large ribosomal subunit, the chloramphenicol, clindamycin, macrolides and linezolide, and the aminoglycosides and the tetracyclines actually target the small ribosomal unit, the 30S. Now, does anything odd strike you here? Is there a group of antibiotics that should not be on this list? Well, since I'm asking, which one is it? Yes, the aminoglycosides. We said that they were bactericidal, right? And they indeed are. So how do they exert their bactericidal mechanism of action by inhibiting protein synthesis? The aminoglycosides, by binding to the 16S rRNA within the 30S ribosomal subunit, actually cause misreading of the genetic code and inhibit the translocation step of the protein synthesis process, which is when the two tRNA molecules together with the mRNA move through the ribosome. Now, this leads to misreading of the genetic code and incorporation of the wrong amino acid in the protein. Now, here's the answer to our question. These wrongly made proteins are incorporated into the cell wall of the bacteria, which ruins the integrity of the cell wall, making this group bactericidal. Now, if you tell me with a hand on your heart that microbiology and pharmacology are not interesting subjects, oh well, there is only so much. I can do to convince you. Moving on to the bacterial nucleic acid synthesis blocking antibiotics. The genetic material of bacteria are, as you know, packed in free floating chromosomes in the cell cytoplasm. They lack nucleus, which makes them prokaryotes in comparison to the eukaryotic cells like our cells, which have nucleus where our DNA is stored. So the fluoroquinolones here, which were Ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, moxifloxacin, norfloxacin, ofloxacin, they all exhibit their bactericidal action by inhibiting the bacterial replication by blocking the enzymes responsible for that, which are DNA gyrase and DNA topoisomerase 4. You have to remember all those enzymes. The metronidazole here, which also is bactericidal, acts by creating free radicals that damage the DNA. But for it to function like that, it needs to be partially reduced, which happens only in anaerobic bacteria and protozoans. The sulfonamides and the TMP inhibit the synthesis of tetrahydrofolate, the THF, which is essential, as you know, in the thymidine synthesis pathway, which leads to inhibition of the bacterial DNA synthesis. Sulfonamides, which include sulfamethoxazole, sulfodiazine, etc., do that by inhibiting the dihydropteroid synthase enzyme. And TME binds to bacterial dehydrofolate reductase. Alright, so we have covered the classification and mechanism of action of our antibiotics, which is a big chunk of your pharmacology and microbiology preparation for all three steps. I hope you found this video useful and in the upcoming videos we will be dealing with each class of antibiotics separately and in details. So stay tuned for those as well and don't forget to hit the bell button to receive notifications for our new uploads after you subscribe if you're new here. Feel free to connect with us on Instagram or Facebook or on our community page on YouTube. Leave us a comment below to let us know what you thought of this video as we love reading what you have to say. Thank you very much for watching, enjoy your studies and see you on the next video.